Hey Growout fans, it's me again, Victor Salinas, with the second video in the series on how to make a fantasy language. Today we're going to be talking about inventing a script, or a written form for our invented language, Sadal. If you've seen the previous video, the first video in the series, you'll be uh, somewhat acquainted with our fictional language called Sadal. Uh, in the last episode, we went over how to come up with the phonemes, or the basic units of sound for that language. It kind of gave the language a tonality or a style, if you will. And in this one, we're going to go over how to use that information to make a sort of written form before we get on to the grammar, which is going to be most of this series. In this video, we're going to review a number of different types of writing, different written forms, and we're ultimately going to choose one that's appropriate for our fantasy language. And then we're going to actually develop the characters, uh, the symbols that we're going to use for Sado. But before we get started, I'd like to thank all of my viewers personally for watching this video series or any of the other videos here on the Growout channel. And I want to extend my thanks and also an invitation for anyone that has any questions for me about any of these videos. I'm always very happily taking any of your questions via email. You can email me personally at victor.salinas at growout.com. I'll put that email address in the video itself and also in the video description. You can ask me uh, any questions really about these videos, about my own work and writings, about me personally. I'm always very happy to answer everyone's questions and those of you who have asked me questions before will know that you will always get a response. I try to get back to everyone within 24 hours and I'm always very glad, very pleased to get any sort of uh, comments or questions or feedback from you guys so I can continue uh, to assure myself that I'm making the types of videos that you guys want to see. So moving on to our writing system for our fictional language, first we want to define exactly what is writing. And simply put, writing is a method of representing a language in a visual form. So uh, language, as you know, it originally arose in our world, came about by sounds that we make with our mouth. So it's the verbal form that's really the first part of all language. And that's why we started with defining the phonemes or the sounds possible in our language. Writing, uh, at least in our history, came much, much later, and that's why we're moving into writing as a second part. A lot of people who like to make up their own fantasy languages, me included, uh, will start with uh, just making up the symbols and then coming up with the sounds that those symbols make. But really, uh, if you want to do it the right way, I really think you need to do it the other way around and define the sounds, uh, give your language a tonality, and then make the symbols to represent that. Now, of course, not every language is going to have a writing system, and I want to talk about that briefly. In our language, Seidel, it doesn't really have a context, it doesn't have a culture. In the previous video, we kind of gave it a tonality that's similar to the Romance languages like Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, and French. So we might say, uh, if we were using Seidel in a book series that we were writing, uh, we might say that the speakers are fairly sophisticated, perhaps a little bit technologically advanced. Uh, certainly to the point that they might have writing, uh, even kind of like ancient earth. So if a fantasy language that you're inventing is sophisticated enough, if it has a society behind it that's sophisticated enough to have settled down uh, in a sort of sedentary lifestyle, uh, has agriculture, is going to produce enough wealth in society to have some of its persons not always engaged in agriculture and hard labor, you then have a class of professionals that will arise, and you'll probably see writing uh, somewhere around that time emerge. Uh, if you're a hunter-gatherer or a nomadic sort of society, you really don't have the time and the spare manpower to create abstractions like writing, uh, numerical systems, mathematics, etc. So for all intents and purposes, without going too far into who the people who will speak Sadal are going to be, we're just going to say that they're sophisticated enough to have discovered a writing system or invented a writing system. So written forms in our real world have many, many different types. And we're just going to go over three of the most basic types of writing systems that are still in use in the world today. The first of them is the ideogram. And an ideogram is sort of like uh, the Chinese or Japanese kanji characters in which each of the symbols kind of stands for an idea 
and those symbols don't really correspond to certain sounds. And the ideograms had to be taken together in context to give you the really the meaning of what's being said. And what's interesting about some real world ideograms like the uh, kanji characters is that they can actually be understood uh, fairly well over several different languages because they all draw on the same roots, whereas the spoken forms to actually s pronounce those words out loud cannot be understood. For example, with the differences in Cantonese and uh, the standard Mandarin Chinese, the characters may be very similar in many instances and can be understood in the written forms, but the written forms have nothing to do with the way that those words are actually pronounced in the verbal or spoken form of those languages. And that seems kind of peculiar to us today to think, uh, at least us in the West, to think that writing is disconnected from the language that people speak. But that's really not all that common, especially in a historical context. We don't have to go back very far in uh, Western history to see that, where Latin was the language of writing, even though no one really spoke it. Uh, you might have spoken in, in medieval times uh, German, uh, Old English, Italian, Spanish, etc., uh, but the language of writing was not the language that you spoke. It was an entirely different language, Latin, that was only used for reading and writing. The second type of writing system that we have to consider would be the syllabary. Uh, syllabary is somewhat similar to an alphabet, but instead of an individual sound, each symbol represents a different syllable. Uh, very famous uh, syllabaries include the hiragana and katakana scripts from Japanese where each individual character represents a different syllable. And so here it's much more simplified compared to ideograms. The concept of ideograms are, are very old. For example, in uh, Eastern languages that system has been in place for a very long time. It's very traditional uh, and it is very hard for foreigners to learn, especially in the West, where we have a different writing system. So that presents its own uh, unique opportunities and challenges. So in a syllabary, you have uh, syllabograms. And again, each of those syllabograms stands in for one syllable. So if you have a sequence of three different syllabograms, you have a total of three different syllables for that word. One syllable, one symbol. And that allows a higher degree of flexibility uh, compared to ideograms, where the idea with ideograms is you don't so much pronounce them or sound them out, you get the inference of what they mean based on having to know what the symbol means in that context. Uh, it's almost more like interpreting the meaning rather than reading it literally, uh, although that's not entirely true. Uh, we're getting now with the syllabary closer to representing the true phonemes as they appear in the language and less abstract. And the last form that we'll consider, I think most of us will be familiar with, is the alphabet. And in an alphabet you have one symbol to stand in for one phoneme, and that allows us to have a really high degree of flexibility. Now that's not always the case. Uh, we can point to any language and find pieces of the alphabet that make the same sounds as others and there's a lot of complex rules especially when it comes to spelling and we can ignore that for now uh that's not the necessarily the most uh analytical representation of how real world alphabets work but the basic idea of an alphabet is you have one symbol one sound so things are much easier uh for example i might be wrong on this but to be considered proficient in Japanese, one needs to know about 2,000 kanji symbols, and again, depending on how those symbols are arranged, you can get many different words or connotations. In each of the syllabaries in Japanese, there are 68 characters, and again, there are two different syllabaries in that language. Uh, however, in the English alphabet, you only have 26 symbols to have to remember, and for the larger part of most languages that use alphabets, uh, they're phonetic, so it's pronounced more or less the way that it's written without having to really interpret anything. So to make things really easy on us, we're going to definitely choose an alphabet form for our fictional language of Seidol. It's the easiest, it's the most straightforward, and it won't take up a million videos for us to go over uh, all the different characters that we would need for the other forms. 
So if you'll remember from the last video, we had a total of 23 basic phonemes and the 15 diphthongs. So that will leave us with a total of 38 symbols that we're going to use. So we're going to have a total of 18 consonant symbols, 5 vowel symbols, and the 15 diphthong symbols. Now, in most alphabetic systems, uh, at least in the real world, you definitely have symbols for consonants and vowels, and the diphthongs are combinations of vowels, but uh, to kind of give Sado a little bit of a, a uniqueness, I'm going to just make uh, each of the diphthongs a different symbol that's separate from the vowels themselves. Just it, it, it adds a little bit of complexity, but at the same time, I think it adds a little something to it. Now, when coming up with the symbol shapes, uh, for any language that I've made up in the past, the first thing that I do is uh, just take a piece of paper. It can be when I'm standing in line uh, waiting for something. I might have a small notebook I usually carry uh, and a pen in my pocket or uh, kind of like touchpad on my phone. I have a little scribbling app, something like that. Uh, I'll just scribble down random lines and I'll get a lot of those and just kind of get like a fluid motion going on with lots of different scribbles and then use those scribbles to kind of uh, formulate a pattern to the way that the script should look. And you'll want to throw in a lot of intentional similarities. Uh, if you think in the English alphabet you have letters like D, B, and P that look really similar to each other, you'll notice a couple of similarities here in this Sadal script uh, where I kind of took the same symbol and turned it different directions or add tiny little differences. Uh, if you think of letters like T and F, they look very similar, so I kind of did those sorts of similarities across all the symbols to make it look coherent. And you'll notice that the consonants have like a straighter look to them, and the diphthongs and vowels have uh, more curvature. And that would be kind of representative of the natural progression of language. If you look at the way that written languages uh, like the Latin alphabet have evolved over time, for example, the capital and lowercase letters, uh, the Latin alphabet has uh, always had capital and lowercase letters, just like Greek before it. But the capital letters uh, really came into play when one was writing on stone or wood. And if you notice, capital letters are much more uh, straight uh, to make it easier to carve into uh, statues and pedestals and buildings and things of that sort. And the lowercase letters are smaller and uh, more fluid looking so that they're easier to write by hand. That's why we don't always write uh, in all capital letters. It's, it's, it's an easier form of manuscript. So I try to keep little considerations like that in mind uh, when forming a script uh, to make it look like it evolved naturally and it's not just uh, one guy sitting in his uh, back office doodling all these little symbols. We'll go over a couple example words. The first one is hadranen, which means tool, and you'll see here that has eight total symbols just like it would be written out in English. The second example we have is balto, to speak, which has six symbols, just as we'd expect. And this next one, sie, means on top of or on top, has two symbols. Again, if you'll remember, the consonant s is going to have just one symbol. And then the diphthong ye, which is the combination of i and e, has its own symbol, so we just have two symbols for that word, even though in English it would be written out in three letters. Now, for our script in Seidel, since we do have some rules as far as changing the basic stress, the stress usually falls on the second to last word as we reviewed in the last video. Uh, in the last video, I, I used an accent mark from uh, like Spanish to note where there was a difference in stress in a word that breaks the normal rules. Uh, I also have a few other markings to add to Seidel, like uh, an accent mark, a diacritical mark here that you see in the word hadranen. The stress falls on that first vowel there instead of the second one, as would be the normal rule. So we have this little hat <laughs> to add on top of a vowel that has that stress fall on it instead. And in this language, I have something that is kind of like a period at the end of a sentence. I'm not going to do an exclamation point or a question mark. I'm just going to say in this culture, at least as far as uh, its current state goes, they don't use it and don't need it. 
Uh, in the Latin script, there was not always a question mark and exclamation points, or even periods, or even spaces in between uh, letters. Uh, when it was originally written, you know, back in Roman times, they would write all the words together in one single line without a break. That made it a little bit difficult to read, uh, to say the least. But it's not surprising that it used to be that way, being that when you hear something spoken out loud, there's not really much of a pause in between words. It's just one continuous piece. So they would write that way. It wasn't until medieval times where they added all these little uh, additional bits to help people read and make it a lot easier. Writing kind of emerged as a tool of uh, accountancy and governance and wasn't necessarily meant to be easy to learn. If anything, it helped uh, the rulers keep control by making it very difficult to use and required years of special training. So little conveniences like uh, punctuation marks, accent marks, uh, and even spaces in between words shouldn't be taken for granted. That's something that came much later. So I'm going to say that Seidal isn't quite along the same lines of convenience as maybe some modern languages are. So that about wraps it up for this video. I know this one is a little bit shorter than the last one. The next ones are going to be uh, quite a bit longer. We're going to go into some basic grammar. The next one's going to be focusing on verbs, uh, what are verbs, and how to conjugate them, and how to use them in sentences. This one, uh, by necessity, needed to be a little bit shorter. I just wanted to show you the symbols talk a little bit about how I come up with the symbols and go over the different types of writing systems that you could possibly use. Again, I always like to use the real world as inspiration. Uh, before coming up, let's say if you're going to do your own language that was ideogrammic, I would definitely recommend uh, reading up on real ideogrammic languages. Real ideograms like uh, Japanese and Chinese would be really great examples of that. Uh, just use that as a kind of guide. Uh, adapt the real world for your own purposes so that when whatever you do come up with is going to have a feel that it was uh, evolved naturally over time by many people instead of just uh, invented or contrived by one person. Uh, I value everyone's feedback and I would encourage anyone with any questions, comments, uh, concerns to come to me personally. You can always email me at victor.salinas at growalt.com. I'll put my email address in the video itself and also in the video description. And of course, you can always leave me a comment in these videos. I will always answer your emails, answer your comments, get back to everyone. I try to do that within uh, about a 24-hour time frame. I sometimes fail at that, but I do promise, as always, to get back to everyone that sends something along my way. I really would not be doing any of this without any of you guys watching this. And I want to make sure that I'm always making the videos that you guys want to watch. So I'm very open to suggestion. And honestly, this video series, along with almost everything that I've done on this channel, has all come from viewer suggestions. I always take uh, your suggestions to heart and use them uh, to make videos so that you guys are always getting exactly what you come for. Don't forget to share and rate this video if you liked it, and subscribe to the Growl channel. I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye.